You can see time and time again there was a, a faith that was within, there was a longing, there was a hunger that was in the prophet Elisha to hold on to his master, to hold on to see what he has experienced. He has experienced some great miracles that the prophet has done, but he wants to hold on and hold on. He says, I'm not going to leave it till the very last. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to stay by you. I'm going to stand by you. I'm going to stick by you. Now you can see the difference between the life of Gehazi and Elisha. And the relationship that Gehazi had with Elisha. Yes, he had a passion by driving away the Shunammite woman. But we go through and see over here, Elisha was longing for a double portion anointing. And then Elijah asked him, how? What do you want from me? What do you want from me? And then he says, well, then give me a double portion of your anointing. And then Elijah says, what you've asked is a difficult thing. What you've asked, in verse 10, he says, so he replied, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So Elijah is saying, but if you see me, what I do, uh, it's, it's not biblical, it's not biblical, it's a doctrine, but what, what I like to see is, you know, the, what, what Elijah is basically telling Elisha, if you see with the eyes of faith. If you really see with the eyes of faith what God can do, nothing can stop you from having that double portion anointing over your life. Can you say amen? amen. amen. If you see with the eyes of faith, nothing can hinder you from having the double portion anointing over your life. And you can see over here, Elisha stuck by Elijah right to the end. And now we come back to the story of Gehazi. We see what has happened. The Shunammite woman has come. He's trying to thrust her away. And Elisha is there. He says, Stop. He rebukes basically. He rebukes Gehazi. He says, Stop. Don't, don't, don't push her away. I can see that her soul is deeply troubled. You can see that in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4. 2 Kings, chapter 4. Verse 29. No, no. Verse. 26 onwards, please run now to meet her over there, and then verse 27. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and has not told me. Now you can see over here the difference. I believe if Gehazi was really operating in the spiritual, if Gehazi was really operating in the ways of God, he would have recognized what Elisha felt, what Elisha felt. He would have felt the same feeling what Elisha felt. But in fact, the zeal, because you know what, the worldly thing is to do right. And the right thing is to take the woman away. Another person come for another healing. Another person come at the prophet to beg for a healing. Take her away. That's a worldly way. But Elisha is rebuking Gehazi and saying, stop. Stop it, Gehazi. Because I can sense it in my spirit. I can sense it because why? Elisha is connected with the spiritual. Elisha is connected and he knows that there is something wrong. But Gehazi is not. He's ready to take her away. Elisha said, stop, don't do that to her. I can feel, I can sense the distress that's crying out within her. And the Lord has not revealed it to me. And then you see what he tells. In verse 29 he says, Then he said to Gehazi, go. Get yourself ready and take my stuff in your hand and be on the way. Let me meet you. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed him. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid the staff on the face of the child. But there was not, neither voice nor hearing. Therefore, he went back to meet him and told him, saying, The child has not awakened. Now when I read the scripture, I said, oh man, he was an obedient person, Gehazi. But you know, as I was meditating more and more on the scripture, and there was something that was, you know, something not right about Gehazi here. And I'm not saying that this, you take this as a doctrine saying, so this is what I'm saying, but I believe when I've been preparing, the spirit leads me and, and guides me a few things, and I like to share this with you. I'm teaching this more as a sharing, not as a doctrine teaching, but this is what I, I see over here, Gehazi was a man, can you imagine just as what has happened just now? He's gone to the zeal to re rebuke the lady and take her out and Elisha has in front of the lady rebuked him. Now is he in high spirits already? You think Gehazi is in high spirits already? He's been rebuked in front of a woman by his own master. Let her alone, Gehazi, let her alone. And now, 
Now his master is telling him, go take my staff and go to that boy and lay it on his face. Yeah, right master. First of all, you insult me. Now you want me to go and perform a miracle. Is that the right attitude? I think, I, for me, I personally believe that was not the right attitude that Gehazi was even going in. And you can see when he's running there, he goes there and he does his obedience, he's not talking to any master. But what's going through his mind when he got those? All the questions that's in his mind, he's not greeting anybody, he's not talking to anybody, but all the doubts, all the things that is going through his mind right now, nobody else knows. And he goes, puts a throw, a star on the boy's face, oh, nothing's happening, let me go back to my master. Now let me tell you something, saints. Is this a possible situation for a breakthrough to happen in your life? Too often, I'm not saying this is how Gehazi felt, but I believe this is how Gehazi would have felt, and that's why the miracle did not happen. Because the prophet had given clear instructions what to do. And we've seen time and time again when the prophet tells something to do, like he told before his son, go and tell Naman to dip in the Jordan seven times. And that's what happened. The man dipped in this Jordan seven times and he was healed. Now, if why not in this case that Gehazi is instructed very specific instructions, go and lay the staff and the boy should be healed. But this doesn't happen. Because I believe the instrument that God uses as well needs to be connected with God. You and I, we are instruments of God and God uses us as His child for His mercy, for His blessing, for His miracles to flow through into life. And when Gehazi is come over there, he puts a staff on the boy's face and he's gone. Hey Elisha, nothing happened. I tried what he told me. Nothing happened. And now you see what happens when Elisha comes in. When, verse 32, when Elisha came into the house, there was a child lying dead on, the, on his bed. He went in there for, shut the door behind the two of them. He didn't take his inside. Can you imagine that? Normally, a, a prophet would always take his servant wherever he would go. Because he is the next prophet in line. He is the one who is going to receive the double portion of Elisha. He is the one in the next line of prophets. And if he, Elisha, wanted Gehazi to be in that, he would have well enough taken him in the room, but he shuts the room behind, he shuts the door behind that woman and his servant, Gehazi. And then you see what happens over there. When Elisha went in the house, there was a child lying dead on the bed. He went in there for, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Can you see the difference? Gehazi went, Abba in Jesus' name, nothing happened, Lord. But Elisha, a man of God, first thing he does, goes and prays in the name of the Lord. He's gone and he's praying in the name of the Lord. And see what happens. He, uh, then, uh, then he went and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, the eyes on the eyes and his hands on hands, and stretched out himself on the child and the flesh of the child became warm. He returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. Now you see the miracle here? Elisha went, he went, prayed, got the hand of God, went and laid himself upon the boy's child. The boy, after I believe a time, the boy's body grew warm, but there was still no life. Now Elisha could have easily gone just like Gehazi. I tried this out, it didn't work. Sorry, you my woman. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. No, but he went back and forth, back and forth. I believe he was there in prayer, back and forth. Lord, I believe for a miracle. Lord, I believe that this is going to happen. Lord, I believe for life again in this my son's eye. I believe, I believe, I believe. And then again, he goes and stretches out himself. And then the miracle comes again. And the child is raised to life. Now you can see the difference between years over here. I tried once, it didn't happen. Because there was something different in the spirit of Gehazi that was in the spirit of Elisha. Elisha was not going to take no for an answer. Elisha was in this rooted in the spiritual. He wanted to know the things for God. He prayed. He was there in prayer, rooted in prayer. But Gehazi was just following orders. Just being religious. Can you imagine the potential that this man had, saints? If Elisha, if you, and it's really amazing when the Bible talks of a double portion anointing, if you go to the Bible and see, Elisha has done exactly the double number of miracles, at least the Bible records, of what Elijah has done. Have you, have you ever noticed that? Read. Read in the Bible. Elijah had the number of miracles that Elijah had done, and then you go and read the number of miracles that his prophet, his servant, Elisha had done. It's exactly the double the number of miracles that Elijah had done. I believe God's word is not just there just for numbers and just to entertain us. God's word is there for you and for me to hold on. And God is true to his word. And I believe this man, Elisha, had the potential to have a double portion anointing of Elisha. If he really desired for it, if he really longed for it, 
he would have been the next Elisha, desiring the word of God, doing the word of God, doing the powerful works of God in his life. But he chose to be religious. I'm happy doing my religious stuff. I'm happy doing what I'm told to do. I'm happy doing, I'm happy being where I am. In the story over here, it really, when I did the story of the Sunamite woman, I was meditating on this character of Gehazi, and I said, why Lord, why, why Gehazi couldn't do? He was obedient, he was, he was, uh, you know, just there, but you know, you just go to see later on as you go in the scripture, and you see the heart of Gehazi really being revealed. Who this person Gehazi is, you will actually come to know as you go into the next chapter, in chapter 5. Gehazi was a man who was not only religious, but I believe he missed his opportunity because he had his mind set on the worldly things rather than the heavenly things. When you set your mind on the worldly things, you are axing off the spiritual things in your life. God is not axing off things. That's why I'm saying you are axing off the spiritual things in your life. God has a spiritual purpose for you. And I, time and time again, I've told you, you are not a human being. You are a spirit. God didn't breathe his body in you. He breathed his spirit in you. So you are not a human body, but you are a spirit who lives in a body and has a mind. Many of us get out thinking upside down. I'm Trevor, I'm in this body, and I have a spirit, and I think I, I, think I have a mind. Not because I'm Indian, I have my name. Anyway. <laughs> we get our whole thinking messed up upside down. But who you really are, you are the breath of God's Holy Spirit. He breathed life into you, He breathed the Spirit into the nostrils of man. Amen. You are a spirit. You live in the body. So what happens when this body dies? Does Trevor die? No. The spirit of Trevor still lives. So you will have an uh, eternal consequence depending on the decisions on the choices that you make in this day and age, in this life. If it's for God, you will be rewarded. If it's not for God, you know what's going to happen. And this man, Gehazi, had his mind set on the worldly things. And in the story, I'm not going to this whole story in a matter of time, but I encourage you to read this, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. It talks about uh, the man. Now it says, oh, I just want to give you a rough idea of what was the temptation that Gehazi was facing about. Okay. Actually, over here, it says uh, in chapter 5, Now the man was the commander of the, of the army of the king of Syria, and was great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, but because by, by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, he was also a mighty man of war, but a leper. <clears throat> and the Syrians had gone for raids and all those things, then there was a Jewish girl, a servant girl who tells Naman, go, there's a man of God who's in Israel, basically making a long story short, and go to him and he, uh, he will sing. And the king, in verse 1, the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took, the, took with them, see what he took with them, 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. Okay, I was just getting an equivalent to, of this in today's, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Okay. Anyway, it's, it's equivalent to one talent is equivalent to about 70, 76 pounds, which is about roughly about 35 kilos. Okay? So when he's talking about 10 talents, he's taking with him about 760 pounds or 350 kilos of silver. Okay? Shekels. Uh, 6,000 shekels of gold. This was equivalent to about 8 kilos or maybe about 18 pounds of gold. Okay? So he was uh, getting this annually 10 sets of clothing. 
Now when they say clothing, it's not only just one shirt or one pant, or today's we go shorter and shorter according to today's day and age of clothing. But it was a proper full set of clothing. It was a they had the inner robe and outer robe and all those things. And it, and it was a finest set of clothing. So you're thinking ten of them. So this is what he said about about 760 pounds of silver, about uh, roughly about uh, how many pounds of gold, and and ten sets of clothing. And he's going out to meet the king of Israel so that he can be healed. He's coming. He's ready to pay his reward for this healing. And now we see through the course of time, Elisha sends his uh, his servant and tells him, "Go and tell Naaman, go and dip yourself in the river Jordan uh, seven times, and you should be cleansed." And all this uh, story goes on, and Naaman says he's angry, and all those things happen. But in the end, he's obedient. He goes and dips himself in the river Jordan seven times, and when he comes out seven times. His skin is clean and new as a baby, and he's just so excited about what God has done. Now he's like some way like who's a new believer. How many of you remember when you're a new Christian, when you've just given your heart to the Lord? How excited you are about that. How passionate you are about that. Yes, I remember, I want to preach to everybody that Jesus is what Jesus is in my life. I didn't know much about the Bible, but I would go and tell everybody, hey, you know, Jesus, you should become a Christian. They would ask me why. I don't know why, because this is what he's done to me, but you should become a Christian. What he's done to me is good. And you know, you don't, you don't know how to explain, but you are got a zeal and a decision to live for God. And that's how Naman is right now. He's experienced a fresh touch of God. And he's coming back to Elisha the prophet and saying, Elisha, thank you, your God. Truly now I know that there is no God in all the world except Israel. And he comes and says, Here, let me offer you these gifts. And Elisha the prophet says, As surely as the Lord lives, I will not take anything and let me tell you something. Was it easy for Elisha to say as well? I believe mean, it was quite hard. Because Elisha, let me tell you his background. He came from a well-to-do family. And from the time he's followed, become a follower of Elijah the prophet, he's left all his wealth and everything behind. Now he's a man who's living on people's generosity. We've seen the Shunammite woman who showed her generosity to this world. And that's how the prophets in that days lived. They were not getting a salary. They were not getting a stipend or a bonus from the king. Go and preach and I'll pay you so much. They were not like uh, visiting pastors who are you're paid for your job. They were waiting on believing for people to be generous. And now here, he has an opportunity. Imagine this. 750 pounds of silver. I believe the, over 100 pounds of gold and clothing. What would he, he could have easily, his rest of it, he could have started his new Elisha the Prophet Ministries. Please send your donations to Elisha the Prophet Ministries. No, he, he didn't do all that. But he said, even though how hard it was for him, he says, as surely as the Lord lives, because his, no, his spirit was connected with God, but God is my provider. I don't need to rely on this worldly things. And the reason I believe, you know, it really shows something in this story. Why did the prophet not take his money? It shows that God's mercy is free. I would imagine if, uh, if, Ramar had, if Elisha had to take money for that, he would go back to that and oh, I paid for my healing. I paid for my healing. And I paid a big price. That's a big amount of money. I paid for my healing. But God wanted him to know, a pagan man to know, that God is a merciful God. God is a merciful God. And by taking that money, it would be an insult to God. Because his gifts cannot be bought. His mercy can never be bought. He shows mercy. I have mercy upon who I have mercy. And he had mercy. I mean, Jesus uses this example. And says, were there not lepers in Israel that, that he cleansed the Naman, a Syrian commander? Jesus uses that as an example. And Elisha refuses, even though the temptation of Elisha, but he had his hand and his mind fixed on the heavenly things, not on the earthly things. But then we see in the same story when Gehazi hears about this. Gehazi's greeting, verse 20, it says, But Gehazi, the son of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has paid the man the Syrian, while, while not receiving from his hands what he bought, but as surely as the Lord lives. <laughs> Can you see? You know what I call today, in today's day and age? I would say, praise the Lord. In that day, they would say, as surely as the Lord lives. They would say, praise the Lord. He's saying, praise the Lord. I will go and take as surely as the Lord lives. He is mad. Can you see the foolishness? He's doing something evil act and he's believing as surely as the Lord lives. He's thinking, oh, God is going to go for God. No. Because when your mind is set on the worldly things, you don't think with the mind of God. You think you're doing right, but you're totally wrong. This is a man 
can you see his heart? Fixed on the world. As surely as the Lord lives, I will not let this man go. I'll tell you where I've been talking on making most of every opportunity. Guess he made most of every opportunity that came his way <laughs> in the greed. Not in the spiritual, but in the worldly. As surely as the Lord lives, well, there's an opportunity to take money, let me take money. When there's an opportunity to get something out of somebody, we always take hold of that opportunity. And when his own master has let him go, there's a reason why his master has gone, let him go. But rather than focusing and thinking, God, why did my master let him go? And getting a mind of God, he's like, as sure as the Lord lives, I will not let this Naman go without paying for it. And he goes running back and see what he does. He lies. And he tells my master sent me, saying there are two sons of the prophet just coming and they don't have anything to eat. Can you give me one talent of silver? That's still 75 pounds of silver. And, uh, and two sets of clothing. And Naman is so jealous because he's a bit like a new believer, you know. You know, some, uh, sometimes I think the new believer is the most vulnerable person when you want to rip, rip them off. <laughs> when you tell them, man, God is doing mighty things in your life, can you give some money? Oh yes, God said we will give and they'll just open up and give because they're just so excited about what God has done. They just want to be generous. And that's what this guy is taking uh, advantage of a new believer in the law. And he's going and says, he says, what are you asking for? One, take two talents. I came to give all this to your master, but he refused. Take, take two. He gives him two talents of gold, and he was so heavy that he had to tell two servants to carry them and leave it. And now, when Gacy comes to the mount, he says, "Okay, all right, my friend. Pare, keep it here. Please go home. Thank you. Thank you very much." And he goes, puts it in high and he goes into the presence of Elisha the prophet, as if nothing happened. And how many of you know one lie just leads to another lie? And Elisha asked him, "Where were you, Gacy?" The servant went nowhere. The servant was right here. You see, this one lie, to count on that one lie, you can see that's the worldliness. When your mind and heart is set on the worldly things, you can see what happens. And then Elisha says, Did my spirit go with you at Gezi when you met and met up with Naman? Now, let me tell you something. That same leprosy that was in Naman will come upon you and your descendants. Can you see the foolish mistake of Gezi did not affect him but his family? And what I see, this, way, this is where I believe that there was no repentance because Elisha clearly commands and says it will be on you and your descendants forever. Forever. And he went out leprous, white as a snow from the presence of Elisha. Lepers could never associate with themselves. We know the Levitical law of how lepers had to have their own separate camp, had their, had their own dwelling, they could not mix around with these people. So he was sent out. Imagine a man of God who had the potential to be the next prophet of Israel now living in a leper's camp. The man of God who could have operated in the dull portion of the prophet Elisha is now living, and not only him, his family, his sons, living as lepers. You know, I, it's very interesting and uh, the rabbinical tradition confirms what I was praying and believing actually. It's not in the Bible, but if you go to the rabbinical traditions and they have many rabbis who have written and they have a lot more written on Gehazi. I don't take that, I'm not, once again, I'm not teaching that as a doctrine, please don't get me wrong. But I, I feel this all this at times benefits me. And the rabbinical tradition teaches uh, over here, uh, if you turn to the book of six, uh, Second Kings, chapter six, sorry, chapter seven, chapter seven and verse three, this is we know when uh, Elisha heard the word of God that the famine was going to get over. Now it says over here, verse three. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to them, one another, "Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we enter the city, the uh, famine in the city will kill us, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we shall die also. Now therefore, come, let us go and surrender to the Syrian army." The rabbinical tradition teaches us that this four leprous men was Gehazi and his three sons. I'm not saying that as a truth, okay, please, this is not a doctrine, but there are, they have a lot more on the story of Gehazi. They, they even went and uh, even when the prophet Elisha goes to Damascus, he goes and asks Gehazi to repent, but there was a, a stubborn heart within Gehazi. This is all the rabbinical tradition. I'm not saying it's the Bible, all right, please. Please don't don't uh, see. But I'm just telling you as a guideline. This is what I've seen as well. The rabbinical tradition teaches that this whole leprous man 
for uh, were Gehazi and his three children. But it doesn't know the fact that these four men were Gehazi and his children or no. It was a fact that he was leprous. It was a fact that he had lost or asked the spiritual opportunity that was given to him in his life and got a hold of a worldly and he paid the consequence not only him but his family also paid the consequence for that. I'll just close with this story since I know I've gone a bit high, uh, longer than my normal time. I don't know what are the opportunities God has put in your life. But I do believe day after day God is bringing opportunity after opportunity in your life. The question today is, are we just being religious in what we do? Are we being religious in our thoughts? Are we being religious in the way we do things? Are we approaching the Bible in a religious way? Or are we getting a hold of God in the spiritual way, in the spiritual way that needs to, that we need to get? God, I need your Holy Spirit to lead me. I need your Holy Spirit to guide me. I need a spiritual oomph in my life. The second thing I want to ask you today is, where is your heart set? The Bible clearly tells us the love for money is the root of all evil. It's not money which is the root of all evil. I believe if Elisha would have taken that, would not be evil. But Gehazi had a love for money that more than the love for God. More than the zeal and the passion that he had for his living God, he had a love and a passion for the gold, for the silver. He couldn't resist that shining things in front of his eyes. And that was the root of evil in his life. My question to you today, saints, where is your heart? Where is your heart? Are you really getting a hold of God the way God wants you to get a hold of Him? Like Elisha, not letting go and say, where are you God? As surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Or are you like Gehazi, putting the staff in the hand, oh Lord, you told me to do this, I did this, you didn't work, go on back and grumble and murmur to God. Look at my life, God. I've been obedient to you. I've been giving my tithes regularly. I've given my offerings. I've been going for prayer meetings. I've been you know, reading my Bible. I've been spending time with you. But look at my life, God. Nothing is happening. Because you are just doing a religion. So just practicing religion day after day. And let me tell you something. For the rest of your life, if you practice religion, that's what you're going to do. Practice religion. But do you have a zeal to live for the Lord today, saints? Do you have the passion to serve God? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Do you have the fire that is burning within you when the disciples see Jesus overturning the money changers and all those things and they looked at him and said, the zeal for his father's house has consumed him. What is the zeal that's consuming you today? Is it the zeal for your family? Is it the zeal for your loved ones? That you put all these other things before God and those things are consuming you in life and you have absolutely no time for God. The word of God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His 